evening, folks. We're glad to have, have you out for our Wednesday evening service. Glad to have the folks on the live stream joining us. And can you believe that a fourth of the year is already gone? Tomorrow's April, what? Fool's Day, right? April 1st. And uh, you remember when John Van Gelderen was here, he was talking about the uh, pastor that pulled that joke. And some of you were snickering, thinking it was Pastor Coles he was telling about. It wasn't. It was some other pastor he knew. But we all thought that he knew something about Pastor Coles that we hadn't told him. And it was kind of interesting that there was somebody else. But uh, talking about John Van Gelderen, I, some of you knew that he was in an accident back uh, when he was here. He had had his car hit by somebody, and he was hoping it would be totaled. Uh, but they were balking about that. It was only about five months old. And I just got a text from him a few minutes ago, and he said that uh, the Lord answered prayer. The other company decided they were going to total it, and so he's got a brand new car. So that's an answer to prayer. And I think we can all rejoice with him in that. Let's Jesus is coming again. Good to be here. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. Lord, we know you're coming. God, would you just bless the service today? Bless our singing. Uh, be with the preacher as he preaches. And Lord, with our folks that are hurting, that are sick, will you just touch them, Lord? We love you and we thank you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening again. It's uh, great to see everyone tonight. Pastor Asher and his family uh, are away this week up in Wisconsin visiting uh, extended family. So uh, pray for them. and They'll be, uh, Lord willing, returning to us uh, this Saturday. Uh, but again, we're glad that you're here tonight. 
and uh, for those joining us via the live stream as well, uh, welcome to our midweek service. Well, it is a, uh, it's a great blessing to study the Word of God, and uh, we look forward tonight to our last night, the last night of our Good News Bible Institute. It's, it's hard to believe it's been uh, 10 weeks, actually 12 weeks. We had uh, two nights off uh, for special services, but this is our 10th and final installment tonight. And uh, we'll be breaking up into our individual classes in just, uh, just a few minutes. But first, let me share a few announcements with everyone. Remember that this Friday evening, we'll have a special uh, service as we look ahead to the Easter weekend and as we remember our Lord's sacrifice for us at Calvary. And so we hope you'll plan to join us this Friday evening at 7 p.m. and we'll be celebrating the Lord's table as well that evening. There'll be no men's prayer breakfast uh, this Saturday, no prayer meeting this, this Saturday morning. So men, please take note of that. And then on Sunday morning, as you're aware, recall that we're going to have a special uh, Easter service beginning at 10 a.m. So note the different start time, 10 a.m., no Sunday school hour that morning. Uh, please invite, plan to invite a friend or a co-worker, family member, whether they attend in person or online, whether they can, of course, tune in via the live stream. Uh, that would be a blessing. Of course, this time of year, there are many folks out there who might come to church who don't normally come. So let's be thinking, praying about who we might uh, invite to join us. Again, that's this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. The Hampton Roads Regional Jail is hosting a virtual banquet on Sunday afternoon, May 2nd. If you'd like information on how you can support that ministry and that fundraiser in particular, and our missionary, Brett Moody, uh, please take one of the handouts that's uh, available on the table in the foyer, and you can learn more about that uh, event and how you can participate. And then some of you saw the email that, uh, that was sent out by the church office uh, yesterday announcing a men's missions trip that we plan to take exactly two months, just about two months from now. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be taking a team of men to help Pastor Ponce and Puerto Rico Baptist College. And you're seeing a uh, photograph or two of uh, some of the buildings there on the campus. That's the uh, their cafeteria. The first uh, photo you saw was... Um, Kind of the main, probably couldn't see the sign above the door. It was kind of small, but uh, uh, it says Puerto Rico Baptist College. And that's, I guess, the administration building, I'm told. And uh, actually some dorm space in there as well. So, again, we're uh, planning on taking a team down there two months from now to help do some scraping, some uh, painting, uh, and some other work. Uh, to be a blessing. Of course, uh, Puerto Rico Baptist College is a ministry that we support financially. Uh, they're, you know, our missionaries, uh, if you will. And so we're looking forward to, uh, to this opportunity to be a blessing to them and to enjoy some fellowship uh, with some of their folks down there. So if you're interested in coming, in coming along with us, uh, man, me soon. We, uh, we do plan to... Uh, nail everything down and even purchase our tickets here in the next week or two. So again, please come and see me and I'll share all the details with you if you'd like to be a part of that. Let's uh, refer to our prayer bulletin at this time. Hopefully you received one of those when you came in uh, this evening or picked one up on the back table. What a privilege it is to uh, be able to bring our our petitions to the throne of grace and receive mercy and find, find grace in our times of need. We have many of those. We are a needy people and we thank God for the privilege of prayer. So do, please do remember to take time once we break up into our classes tonight, take some time to pray. And remember our spotlighted missionaries as well. We have a um, 
as normal, two missionary prayer letters, uh, one from the Crab Trees this evening and another from the Overtons. Make sure you read uh, both uh, of those, whether this evening or you know, tomorrow or sometime later in the week, and pray for those uh, dear families, uh, particularly a uh, heartfelt and touching letter from Brother Overton uh, this time around. But uh, again, let's look at your prayer bulletin. First note the praises at the top of the bulletin, and we thank the Lord uh, for what he did in those, those two situations. And then, as far as new prayer requests go, uh, or updates, new information, uh, to uh, request that you're already aware of. Number four is, is brand new. We just uh, learned about this uh, this morning, actually. Carrie Abbott, um, who, as you know, is, is our missionary to France. Uh, he and his wife, Susan, and their three uh, teenagers. Um, Carrie is waiting on biopsy results. Uh, he just uh, they did some testing yesterday or the day before, and he has an appointment on uh, April 20th uh, to find out the results uh, of that test. And he was teasing me in an email today, uh, you know, that three, that's a long three weeks to, uh, to wait for, for those kind of results. So just be in prayer, be, for pr be in prayer for him and his family, please. Number five, Mark Bailey is having a heart ablation tomorrow at Sentara Hospital, so please pray for him. Number six is an update. Caden, this is the, uh, the Hall's 15-year-old great-nephew. He had uh, heart surgery yesterday, and uh, that procedure went fairly well, uh, but uh, continue to pray for him, please. Uh, number 12, Evie Green. Uh, her surgery this past Monday went well. We praise the Lord for that. Continue to pray for her. Number 13 is a new request. Uh, Elva Priolo's neighbor, uh, Judy, uh, she's been having heart issues. And so please be in prayer for her. Uh, number 20, Flo Stahl. She's been having some pain in her knee and has an appointment with her doctor this Friday. Be in prayer for that, please, as well as the two unspoken requests that uh, she has. And then 21, pray for Bob Turner. Um, he had tests on his lungs March 30th. That was yesterday, I believe. So uh, be praying for the results there. Just be praying for his health and for Bernie's uh, as well. And then uh, received this uh, request right as the service was beginning. And I Let's see, this is from uh, Mrs. Seamster. Uh, pray for Chris Turner. Chris had triple bypass surgery today. Okay? So let's be in prayer for Chris Turner. Triple bypass surgery today. Again, please uh, take time. Once we break up to, into our classes in just a moment, take time to pray for these and other requests that uh, you're aware of. Let's continue to uh, bring one another before the Lord. And again, we're so thankful for the privilege of prayer. Uh, in a moment, again, we're going to be dismissed to our classes, our Bible Institute classes. I think that everybody knows where they're going, but just in case we have... Uh, uh, a newcomer tonight, or perhaps someone who hasn't been here in several weeks, uh, recall that uh, Pastor Tavis Long's class will meet here in the auditorium. That class will be live streamed. Uh, missionary Matt Brown's class on missions will be out in the fellowship hall in the bay all the way down towards the kitchen. And then uh, my class will meet uh, right next to Matt's class, also in the fellowship hall. You are dismissed.
We'll get started here. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll get into our lesson tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for another day you've given to us, and we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, even as we're here and we listen to the rain outside, we thank you for uh, the reminder that spring is on its way. Lord, the warm weather we have enjoyed. Uh, Lord, we just look forward to the, uh, the growth and the, the new life that comes at spring. But Father, we're also reminded of the new life that we have in you. We thank you for our salvation. Father, we look forward in anticipation to this Sunday where as a church we will gather together and in corporate worship praise you and worship you and glorify you because not only did you send your son to die, but he rose again. And we thank you that we serve a risen Savior. Father, I pray that it's because of that risen Savior that we do everything that we do. And though we fail, Father, we recommit ourselves, Lord, to obeying you, to living by your word. Lord, I pray for the requests that were mentioned. Lord, we pray for our pastor who is traveling. Just watch over him and Renee and Garrett as they are in Wisconsin and the, uh, the time that they will have with Mrs. Asher's father, Lord, I pray that you would watch over them, give them safety, bring them back safely. Lord, this Friday as we have a time together of worship again where we will join together as a church to partake in the Lord's table, I pray that we be with Pastor Coles as he brings us the message that evening. Lord, it's a somber time when we think of the crucifixion, but Father, we are thankful that you sent your Son because it's through his stripes that we are healed. Lord, I pray that this time together this evening would be profitable as we conclude this, this series of our faith, of, of the apologetics of our faith, and Lord, tonight as we look into the resurrection, Lord, I pray that you would help us, help us to regain a glimpse of the power of the resurrection. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You should have received two handouts this evening. The first one is the notes for this evening, and the second one is completely voluntary, if you want, I just ask you to be kind, uh, is a critique, if you want to call it that, that's what I called it on there. Uh, if you would, just put the course title there. If you don't remember it, uh, just put, uh, well, if you love the course, uh, it's apologetics. If you don't remember it, uh, if you didn't like the course, just don't put anything. Uh, but uh, just honestly go through and answer those questions if you would. It will help, uh, help me uh, to, to improve and make things better for, for future times if that, that ever comes the case. Uh, and then really particular on the last, if you don't answer anything, just maybe the last two questions or even the last one, what topic, thank you, what topic or courses would you like to see offered? What would you like to study? Uh, and then when you're done with that, you can leave it on their pew. I'll come through and pick them all up, or you could just put them in a pile in the back. Again, you don't need to put your name. Uh, simply just want to look and see, uh, get your opinion, get your, uh, get your thoughts on some things. So uh, if you don't mind filling that out, that'd be greatly appreciated. So we're going to get into our final topic this evening, as Pastor uh, Radice mentioned, and uh, welcome to this final one, the, the fifth lesson. We split each one up. Uh, like I said, we had 10 times we met, but this is our fifth lesson, our fifth lecture. And uh, so as it relates to the critics, as we've been studying, it has to do with defending or making case for the truth of the Christian faith. It is rational arguments for the purpose of proof and defense of Christianity. On your notes there, you'll see I ask a question. If apologetics is the defense of the truth of the Christian faith using rational arguments, does the defense of the resurrection attain to this? And here's, my, here's what I mean by that. This is what we're going to look at tonight. Is the resurrection a rational event? 
In other words, can we make sense of it? Can we explain it using our minds? I think there's, this is going to be a challenge, but I, I don't want to discourage you, and I hope we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at things, because in some ways, yeah, it is rational. It makes sense. Uh, it makes sense in the fact that uh, if, uh, if God is going to send his son to die, he'd have to come back to life if there was to be any meaning behind what he taught and preached for three years and then the promises of the Old Testament. So rationally, it would have to make sense. But then again, we deal with this concept of miracles is what we're going to look at tonight. And if there is a miracle, a miracle does not make sense. You, in other words, you can't use natural law to explain, a way, to explain a miracle because then if you could, it ceases to be a miracle. And this is what a lot of people do, is we'll look into miracles for, for a little bit. And if we look into miracles, and we, for example, if you take Exodus, and you say, there's a lot of plagues there. Were those natural events? Or were they supernatural? Jonah, I think we've talked about this, Jonah and the whale. Was that a natural event? Or was it supernatural? I think we could argue with Jonah. Some people, uh, I being one, I believe Jonah died. Out of the belly of hell, he says, I, he cried. You say, well, that's, that would be a miracle then that he came back to life. Yeah, it would also be a miracle that he survived three days without being digested. <laughs> Either way, there's a miracle that happened there. Jesus walking on the water. A miracle? Pretty soon what we do is we start explaining things away which is what science would like to do, as they say, we learn more, and so we can explain things. And we say, well, you know, it was just an illusion. Jesus really didn't walk on the water. Well, we start picking things apart. We pick apart miracles, but we get to one, the resurrection. I, I want to be careful. I don't know if it's the ultimate miracle, but my goodness, <laughs> I don't know what you would top it. And so we'll look at this. So, we have been looking over the last few weeks, the intersection between faith and reason. And my hope is that you will leave this class bolstered in your faith, better equipped to give a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. So, let's talk about this. It was an ice hockey game during the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid, New York. You probably recall it, played between the... United States, the host nation, and the Soviet Union. February 22, 1980. During the medal round of this hockey tournament, though the Soviet Union was a four-time defending gold medalist and heavily favored, the United States upset them four to three. The Soviet Union had won the gold medal in the five of the last six or the six previous Winter Olympic Games. They were the favorite once more in Lake Placid. The team consisted primarily of professional players with significant experience in intentional in international play. By contrast, the United States, led by coach Herb Brooks, was comprised of amateurs, with only four players with minimal minor league experience. The United States was the youngest team in the tournament and in the U.S. national team history. In the group stage, both the Soviet and the U.S. teams had been un gone undefeated or unbeaten. The U.S. achieved several surprising results, including a 2-2 two -two draw, Against, the, against Sweden in a 7-3 upset of the favored second place, Czechoslovakia. For the first game in the medal round, the United States played the Soviets, finishing the first period tied 2-2. Two to two. The Soviets led 3-2 to two following the second period, and the United States team scored two more goals to take their first lead in the third and final period and held on to win 4-3. Two days later, the U.S. won the gold. That wasn't even the gold medal match. Two days later, they won the gold by beating Finland in their final game. The Soviet Union took the silver by beating Sweden. The victory became one of the most iconic moments of the games and in U.S. sports. Equally well-known was the television call of the final seconds of the game by Al Michaels of ABC, in which he declared, Do you believe in miracles? Yes, yes, we do. In 1999, Sports Illustrated named the Miracle on Ice, 
the top sports moment of the 20th century. And as part of its centennial celebration in 2008, the International Ice Hockey Federation named the miracle on ice as the best international ice hockey story of the past 100 years. Miracle on ice. But was it a miracle? They played within the rules of the game. They played on a, on a hockey rink. Russia had no reason to believe that they were entitled to a win. It was on the field of competition. It was a David and Goliath story, but even in the story of David and Goliath, was that a miracle? Well, we're going to look at that. What is a miracle? Let's define that term. A miracle. A miracle comes from the Latin mirari, mirari, to wander. Wander with not wander, like to not know where you're going, but to wonder. That's the better way to say it, wonder. <laughs> At first and very rough approximation, is, it is an event, a miracle is an event, that is not explicably, explicable by natural causes alone. You can't explain it. A reported miracle excites wonder because it appears to require, as its case, something beyond the reach of human action and natural causes. Historically, the appeal to miracles has formed one of the primary lines of argument in favor of specific forms of theism. The argument typically being that the event in question can best, or, or we would say can only be explained as the act of, of a particular deity. In other words, God has to intervene. That's why the miracle on ice, I'm not sure God intervened. <laughs> I don't know. But it has to be an event that God intervenes in. Remember our guy, David Hume, we mentioned him probably the first time we, uh, the first lecture we had, but David Hume, he famously defined a miracle as this way, a violation of the laws of nature. But this definition has been the focus of much discussion. Bringing the concepts of natural laws into the definition of miracle is problematic. And for a variety of reasons, many have found it unattainable. Let's, for example, the concept of a miracle predates any modern concept of a natural law by many centuries. In other words, what we know to be laws, natural laws, have, a lot of them have been discovered as natural laws within the past few hundred years. That doesn't mean that they, miracles are, you know, that, that, that's not a good definition. I'm just saying that... Back when we read a lot about miracles in the time of Christ, there were a lot of things that uh, they didn't know about. So where it becomes problematic is when you say it's just a violation of natural law. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, they didn't know what those laws were, so it was just superstition then. Another problem with a violation of the laws of nature is becomes difficult to say in some cases which natural laws are being violated by the event in question. We look at some of the miracles uh, that Jesus did, and we ask ourselves, what was the law that was being violated? To give someone back their sight is not a violation necessarily of any law, of a natural law. It's no law that you must remain blind. In fact, we look at our medical situations today and we say when someone takes medication or gets healed for something, we, we look and say, well, they, they got better. And we don't think that is a miracle. Sometimes I think we, we should, and I'll explain that in a second. Another problem with calling it a violation of the laws of nature is sometimes there are deep philosophical disagreements regarding the nature and even the existence of natural law, similar to what I just said about which laws were violated. We don't even know sometimes, we can't even agree on what the natural laws are. Theologian Samuel Clark wrote that the true definition of a miracle in his theological sense of the word is this. Talk about a wordy definition, hang on. 
that it is a work effected in a manner unusual or different from the common and regular method of providence by the interposition either of God himself or of some intelligent agent superior to man for the proof of evidence of some particular doctrine or an attestation to the authority of some particular person. Is we're going to take, it is something supernatural, a it's a supernatural event. But I want to tack on to that the understanding that it is a supernatural event that only can be performed by God. Now, with that comes a lot of presupposition, which is why this is the final evening that we take this topic, because we don't have time to reestablish the existence of God. We don't have time to establish the, uh, the, uh, the, the problem of evil. You say, well, what does the problem of evil have to do with miracles? Because miracles are often, most of the time, in response to something evil. So we don't have time to, just, to go again. We're presupposing this evening that God exists. And that, and this is important, he does intervene. In the affairs of men. I think sometimes, though, we misunderstand what a miracle is. And I think there's two, there's a technical definition, which I think I've shared. It is the working definition that we'll use tonight. It is a, uh, it is a violation of, or it is a supernatural occurrence by God. But I also think that there is just a practical definition of miracle in that when something happens, it will never be a violation of any law, and it may not even be supernatural, but is something that brings your attention back to God, and you glorify and praise Him for it, and you're okay to say, wow, that was a miracle, because the miracle is not necessarily what happened, it's that God is still at work in your life, and that's a miracle because he's intervening and he doesn't have to. Now, he's faithful to us as his children. But there are often things that occur. You heard pastor say this on Sunday when he heard someone say, hey, look in that pocket for that. Well, there's nothing supernatural about that. Except the fact that he's sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That is demonstration of a relationship that is supernatural. A relationship where the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us and, you, and, and, and we have that relationship with God. So I think that's very important. So, you know, I don't want to stand up here and say something as, as scary because you'll throw tomatoes at me to say, when a baby's born, that's no miracle because it's just the natural course of life. I've never had a baby, so I don't think I can say that authoritatively. But at the same time, Anytime God intervenes and does something, and he may use medicine to do that. He may heal someone using the hands of a doctor, using the science, using the research. And I'm okay with calling that a miracle. But for the technical sense of the word, it is something supernatural. And I think we do need to make that, that, that stipulation because it's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself. But if we just keep it as, well, it can just anything that happens, it is how a lot of people just explain away a lot of what's in the Bible. They could say the lady who touched the hem of the garment of, of, of Jesus was, you know, she just had an issue and, and, uh, and, and, and then it, was, it wasn't really a miracle, something just... Her body healed itself, or it, it got over, or, or maybe better, maybe one of those where the demons were cast out. It was really just a, uh, they didn't know, they called it demon possession, but maybe it was epilepsy. And we begin to explain things away, and we try to, go, we try to get science involved, and we just start explaining a lot away. And one such miracle, I think we need to lay this basis because we're going to look at the most profound, I think profound miracle and that is the resurrection. The resurrection. I think in order to look at the resurrection, we need to take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. 
Philippians chapter 3. Why is this important? Let's use the words of Paul here. Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 7. Paul has just given his credentials as an apostle. I'm sorry, not his credentials, his pedigree, not as an apostle. But just as a, a Pharisee, he says, here's why I could brag. Here's why I, I have, you, you should listen to me. But then he says, but what things were gained to me, all those things I gained, those I counted lost for Christ. I was just talking with someone this past Sunday. A lot of times we look at the, these verses about counting things as loss, and we think about all the good things in our past that we have done, that we, you know, we're, we're turning our back on them as if we're some sort of hero, and uh, turning our back on those things in the past and just focusing on God. I think this also deals with a lot of those bad things in your past as well. The guilt and the anxiety, where he says, you know, Paul wasn't a great person. <laughs> By the grace of God, he says, I'm, 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 forgetting those, I'm forgetting those things in my past. And I count those things as loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency, excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Why does he do all this? He tells us in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. I think it's apropos that we be talking about this this week in our final class as we prepare our hearts for Sunday, Resurrection Day. When Jesus was on the earth, he raised four people from the dead. He raised the widow's son in the village of Nain in Luke chapter 7, verse 15. He raised the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, in Mark chapter 5, verse 42. He raised Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha in Bethany, after he had been dead for four days in John 11. So, the widow's son, Jairus, Lazarus, and who was the fourth? He raised himself from the dead after he had been crucified. It's true that the New Testament teaches that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead in Romans 6, 4, Acts 2, 32. But it's just as true that Jesus himself was acting to bring about his own resurrection. We know this because he said in John chapter 10, and let me read it for you. In John chapter 10, he says this. In verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 18, no man taketh it from me. Let me begin at verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Power, that I may know him, and the power of the resurrection. He says he has the authority to lay it down. He has authority to take it up again. God the Father gave Jesus the authority to take up his life again from the grave where his body lay dead. Here it is again in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, verse, 5, verse 21, the Bible says this, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, or maketh them alive, even so the Son maketh alive or quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And then we go back even further to John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, verse 21, he says, let's look at verse 18. We'll get the entire story. 
Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto thus, seeing thou, thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto him, them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, For this was the temple of his body. Destroy the body, and in three days I will raise it up. And he did. So in today's class, this evening, this power of the resurrection is the fundamental question of Christianity. What someone believes about Jesus determines how they will answer so many que other questions that we have, we have dealt with. If Jesus truly is God incarnate, then one will also believe in God. If God could raise Jesus from the dead, then it seems like he could also ordain the contents of the Bible. As we consider this question today, my hope is that we'll take this argument eminently practical so that you can use it in your conversations with those who doubt their faith or with non-Christians who don't claim to have any faith. So, let's do this. Let's just give you the entire outline that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at eight, quest or eight, uh, eight principles, eight um, arguments... That we're going to discuss eight points that I would like to make regarding Jesus. Number one, Jesus is a big deal. Number two, Jesus was a historical person. Number three, Jesus is the point of the history of Israel. Number four, Jesus is spoken about by the prophets of Israel. Number five, Jesus' claim to be divine are corroborated by his life, teaching, and miracles. Number six, Jesus' death and resurrection cannot be explained away. Number seven, Jesus' disciples' lives and the world dramatically changed after his life. And number eight, Jesus has changed lives throughout history, and he is still changing them. We're going to take all eight of those things, and we may not make it through them all, and that's fine. We'll get as far as we can go. If you'll see on your handout, then, there is a diagram of, a, uh, uh, of an arrow, and then you'll see a circle and another arrow. And this is how we're going to approach this. We're going to take these eight, que or eight uh, uh, arguments, and we're going to start, they begin with historical evidence. Everything leads to Christ. And then we have the event of his claims, what he claimed to be, his teaching and miracles. And from that now, we see spiritual evidence. And I hope that'll make sense as we go. So let's begin. I know it sounds perhaps trite and maybe a, a little, uh, uh, sound maybe even uneducated here to say Jesus is a big deal. But I don't know how better to say it. I mean, it is a big deal when we look at what Jesus did for us. When we look at this person, he is a big deal. You all know that Christians make a big deal about Christian or about Jesus. In fact, the word Christian at its core, at its root, is the word Christ. You know this also. Have you ever been to a sports game, a sporting event? And, and you don't see them as much anymore, but you'll see signs that say John 3.16. We live in a world where people make a big deal about Jesus Maybe not as much as they once did, but uh, you can go anywhere, it seems, and, and there will even, unfortunately, you'll hear profanity. So why do we as Christians make such a big deal about Jesus? Well, it's because we believe that our fundamental problem is not a lack of information. That is, we don't simply need to be pointed in the right direction to change our lives. No, what we need is a transformation what the Bible calls a new life. Why do we make a big deal? Not because we just like to have the knowledge, but we know that Jesus is the only one who can transform lives. Our fundamental problem is sin or rebellion against God, which results in us running up a serious debt to God. And because our condition is, because our condition is serious, the treatment must also be serious. And this is why Christians are always talking so much about Jesus, because only Jesus can forgive our sins. 
and cancel the debt that we owe. Only Jesus can cover our sins. Only Jesus can wash them away. Only Jesus can restore you to a relationship with God. Theologically, these are all underpinnings of Christianity. Everything we believe about in, in our theology rests upon Christ. If this is true, it has tremendous implications for Christians. Remember what Paul said to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Let me read it to you. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this. He says in beginning of verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he, ro now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your, your faith is vain, yet ye are yet in your sins." Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Listen to what he says. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Theologically, if true, this has tremendous implications on non-Christians. Because Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is a big deal to Christians and non-Christians. So Jesus is either alive or he's not. He either conquered sin or he didn't. We, can't, we can either have a new transformed lives or we live a lie. This is how high the stakes are for both Christians and non-Christians. So the big question then is, is it true? Is it true? The philosopher Kierkegaard said, the central question of humanity is whether or not Jesus rose again on Easter morning. How we understand that question determines how we will answer every other question. As I mentioned, Christians believe that Jesus is rooted in history, not philosophy, not ideas. And so that leads me to my second point. Not only is Jesus a big deal, Jesus was a historical person. What do we know about Jesus? I trust you don't spend this week on the History Channel finding about what they say about Jesus. What do we know, though, about Jesus? Could you imagine the movie trailer? For the life from a small minority despised people group. In the Roman Empire came a peasant carpenter. For three years, he was itinerant preacher and teacher. He lived only 33. Never held elected office, had a position of power, wrote anything down or left any heirs. This man was killed at the hands of the authorities and his few largely uneducated poor disciples scattered throughout Jerusalem. But out of this has come the church today. It's a pretty miraculous event. We have some extra-biblical references. There are approximately 20 other extra-biblical references to the historical Jesus. I think it's worth mentioning because almost no serious scholar would deny that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. Perhaps the most influential of the accounts we have is from a Jewish historian named Flavius Josephus, who was born in A.D. 37 and became a Pharisee at age 19. In A.D. 66, he was the commander of the Jewish forces in Galilee, but after being captured, he was attached to the Roman headquarters. We also know that Roman historians noted on the activity of Christians. Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman historian, wrote about 50 years after Josephus wrote, and here's what he said. Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, a procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only in Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also. That was Tacitus. Jesus was undeniably a historical figure. But Christians go one step further than simply saying that Jesus was merely a historical figure. 
we believe that the history of Jesus and the words of the prophets serve as a show and tell that, and that 4,000 years of history were preparing for Jesus. Because this brings me to my third point. Jesus is the focal point of the history of Israel. God started making his argument about who Jesus was at the beginning of time. God was working through the history of the Israelites to point them toward a Messiah. Their history was his story. God took elaborate lengths in the Israelites to, to create the ultimate analogy, a word picture on the grandest scale, not just a parable or an analogy, rooted his analogy in history through the lives of the Israelites and their history. Someone is coming, was the prophecy. This is why, and this is what he will be like. Let's look at a few examples of how God worked in the people of Israel. We see at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the fall. A supernatural deliverer will come. In the fall, in Genesis 3, 15, God tells Adam and Eve to look for a deliverer, a human, supernatural, who, and, and that he would, he would, there would be enmity between God and Satan. And there would be a wound to Satan. So we see in the fall, a supernatural deliverer would come. We see in Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, verses 11 through 14, that God, he showed us back then, will provide the substitute. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, when Abraham is about to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, we see more of how God will deliver his people. We see that no higher test of loyalty than to give up one's only son for another. We see that God will preserve the seed of the promise. We see the substitutionary offering is necessary. We see that God provides for his people's needs, and their greatest need is forgiveness. Abraham and Isaac was a picture of that God will provide the substitute. We move on in the story of Israel to the Egyptian captivity or the, and, Pass, and Passover, where God demands a sacrifice, which can only be provided by the death of a perfect lamb. In delivering the Israelites from their Egyptian captivity in Exodus 12 through 15, we see that God demands a sacrifice. Firstborn son represents the family taking on himself the fate of the family. Apart from sacrifice, everyone, even the chosen people, deserve death. Only substitutionary blood can avert death. We see that blood must be displayed publicly. All this taught through the Passover. We move on into Leviticus and we see the example of the scapegoat. Where God declares that one day a year will be the day of atonement. And on that day, the people are reminded that the sins of the people will be forgiven annually. Because people are always sinful. Only a perfect sacrifice is acceptable. Once the sacrifice has been accepted, God sends it out from the people. Sin is transferred and remembered no more. The scapegoat. There's many other examples throughout the Old Testament. Many other narratives from their history where they, where, where to teach, they were to teach the Israelites the nature of man's plight. Sacrifice is needed to deal with man's sin. Suffering must be involved. Combination of divinity and humanity required for salvation. Divine and self Giving And so God was using events to point to and prepare the Israelites for a Messiah who would rise to deliver them. Jesus is the focal point of the history of Israel. You look and read their history, and I'm not sure where you're at in your Bible reading, but if you're going through a, 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 a continual uh, through the Bible, you're, you're probably somewhere around Judges, uh, first uh, Ruth in that time frame. And I, I challenge you, if you haven't, just look for Jesus throughout the entire Old Testament. He's the focal point of their history. We see that Jesus is spoken about by the prophets of Israel. God's version of show and tell. He showed the people his plans through their history, but he also told them what he was doing through his prophets. God sent prophets to explain and predict the who Predict the who, what, when, where, and why of Jesus. The Bible contains over 300 prophecies that testify to and were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let's just go through a couple examples. Who was he? Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 
and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who was he? Isaiah foretold who he was, who he was to be. What was he? We see in Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, we see the prophecy. It says in Psalm 16, verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. So we see what was going to happen. We see that fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 31. In Acts chapter 2, verse 31, this is what the Bible tells us. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This isn't just a coincidental Old Testament prophecy. We read here that Peter is saying, this is what happened. This was fulfilled. We find out in the Old Testament where. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, you're going to be the smallest of the tribes of Judah. Out of you will come from, from me one that will be a ruler over Israel in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. And we can read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, where the prophecy is fulfilled when the Bible tells us, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And who he is foretold. What was to, be, what was to happen? Where it was to happen? We see again in Isaiah how it was to happen. In Isaiah, we look at verse, or Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and shall bear his son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we see it was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Oh, but perhaps the most instrumental prophecy we see is in Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 50, 53, the chapter captures so perfectly the message of Christianity. Jesus is, Christ is clearly the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy, and it is worth writing out in full. Remember, this was written in 680 B.C. This chapter is preserved on the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are dated before the time of Christ. But look what it says in Isaiah, chapter 50, or Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him, and we despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his she her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By the, his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. A tremendous prophecy. We see God used 
show and tell before Jesus lived, to show His divinity and purpose for His coming. Jesus is spoken about by the prophets of Israel. But Jesus' claim to be divine are corroborated by His life, teaching, and miracles. Jesus' life was remarkable. His claims were incredible. Let me ask you a question in the words of the immortal... I'm sorry, let me move on. Uh, Let me ask you this. Jesus is... I'm sorry, I lost my place. Jesus was a wise teacher. Jesus is also universally respected as a great prophet and a great moral teacher by all the world's major religions. His teaching is moral truth exhibited at its purest. It's not wishy-washy idealism, but it is realistic and cogent, the product of a sane mind. Even the opponents of Christianity are quick to point out that they agree with Jesus' moral teaching. In fact, I, I was having lunch today with a chief, and we're sitting there, and he said, he read a book that was on the leadership of Jesus, and he said, the book begins with, just take out all the doctrine and theology and what you believe about Jesus, and we're just going to look at his leadership. I don't think that's the wisest thing to do. But at the same time, there are many who will look at Jesus and they'll say, we agree with what he said. He was a wise teacher. There, nobody would disagree with his moral teaching. Some example of teachings that are attributed to Jesus, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. How about this one? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do not judge and you'll not be judged. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Turn the other cheek. Jesus was a wise teacher. Jesus helped others through miracles. He performed throughout the Bible 23 healings. A man with leprosy was healed. A paralyzed man. A boy with a demon. A crippled woman. An official son. A man born blind. Just some examples of the healings. Nine displayed command over nature. Nine of his miracles were over nature. Feeding 5,000 at one time, 4,000 at another time, calming the storm. Talk about intervening in natural law. Walking on the water. Three, he brought back dead back to life, excluding his own resurrection. Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, Lazarus, as we already talked about. His miracles helped others. He was a wise teacher. His miracles helped others. But Jesus' own claims. There's a paradox about the life of Jesus, which I think you will capture if you read the Gospels carefully. For all his gentleness and meekness, he made some absolute claims. He claimed to be above the law. He lived in a Jewish society where laws and rituals were strictly kept, but he just announced to everyone that he was above the laws. He said, at one point, no one needs to fast while I'm here. He said, you have your laws, you have your rituals, but I just do what my father tells me to do. He claimed to be above the law. He claimed to be able to forgive sin. In Luke chapter 5, There's a great crowd around Jesus, so some men cut a hole in the roof of the house. He was in and lowered a paralytic man on a mat. And he says to him, your sins are forgiven. The audacity to be able to do that. He claimed that no one could know God except through him. We already read it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He claimed that he would rise from the dead. The Son of Man, he said, is going to be betrayed into the hands of of men. They're going to kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. In Matthew chapter 17. And if his claim to be above the law, his claim to be able to forgive sin, his no one, knew God, or no one could know God except through him. His claim that he would rise from the dead is not enough. He claimed to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. John eight fifty eight. He wasn't just using the state of being. He was using the divine name. 
In other words, he was saying, before Abraham was, I am that I am. After Jesus said this, the people tried to stone him because they knew what he was claiming to be. He was claiming to be God. Ultimately, Jesus' life is so remarkable and his claims so clear that it led C.S. Lewis to come to his famous trilemma conclusion. We've talked about this before, that Jesus is either Lord, liar, or lunatic. Let me read it again. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really, this is C.S. Lewis, from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Christ as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He had some pretty extraordinary claims. So Jesus' death and resurrection then cannot be explained away. They serve as God's exclamation point. God used a word picture through a nation. God used prophets to predict. God used Jesus' life, teachings, and claims. And then God used raising Jesus from the dead to put the exclamation point on him. As if he said, okay, here's something. It's either of God or it's not. A skeptic might say analogies, predictions, teachings, miracles, morality. Yeah, yeah, maybe other faiths have these. Rome thought itself an instrument of God. Solomon was wise. Mother Teresa was a good moral person. I'm not convinced Jesus was it. You can find it elsewhere. But I think we can be really, really clear. No one else, no other religion can make the claim that their founder came back to life. They don't even try. And Christians believe that what God accomplished in three short days was the final argument that Jesus was God and that only He can make us right with God. Let me walk you through the evidence of why a 21st century, cosmopolitan, cynical, capitalist consumer can believe that a real person 2,000 years ago physically got up out of a tomb. Ultimately, I don't think this argument and the evidence will ever convince someone who doesn't believe to become a Christian. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal the sin and need for Christ. But my hope is that this evidence will remove a stumbling block in disbelief. So a summary of what happened in Jesus' last days. There was a garden that led to trials, that led to torture and humiliation. A walk to Calvary that ended with crucifixion and then death. Darkness covered the earth. He was placed in a tomb. A large stone and soldiers were put on guard. Three days of silence. There then was an empty tomb. It empowered the disciples and the world was changed. Christianity exploded not because of the death of a martyr, It was because the resurrection of a Savior. This is what empowered the disciples. Christianity doesn't make sense without this resurrection. Jesus died and was placed in a tomb. In reading the account of Jesus' passion, his crucifixion, we notice certain details. He was up all night facing a trial. He was whipped with long, uh, a leather whip with with bone or stone attached to it, the cat of nine tails. He was, a crown of thorns was placed on his head. He carried his cross to Golgotha. Nails were placed in his hands and feet. A spear was placed in his side. So you can't tell me Jesus really didn't die. He died and was placed in a tomb. The evidence is there. 
We see that Jesus was really dead. He was placed in a tomb of Josephus of Arimathea's tomb. Member of the Jewish ruling council. A large stone, some think maybe one to two tons, was placed in front of the tomb. Guards were placed in front of the tomb. Roman seal was placed on the tomb to confirm and warm. Jesus was placed dead in a sealed tomb. And yet three days after this, that tomb was empty. This was never refuted. The disciples were preaching in the vicinity and near the time. People could easily have walked to the tomb. Some no doubt did, but that tomb was empty, was never refuted. The very fact that his, this, uh, this early proclamation of the empty tomb took place in Jerusalem is remarkable. Silence speaks loudly. And there are really only few potential explanations for this. How did, he, how did they place a dead person in a tomb who, three days later, the tomb was empty? Well, there's some who would say, well, he didn't really die. He just swooned. He passed out. And I think John Stott best refutes this scenario. He says, are we to believe that after the rigors and pains of trial, mockery, flogging, crucifixion, he could survive 36 hours in a stone sepulcher with neither warmth nor food nor medical care? that he could then rally sufficiently to perform the superhuman feat of shifting the boulder which secured the mouth of the tomb, and this without disturbing the Roman guard. Then that weak and sickly and hungry, he would appear to his disciples in such a way as to give them the impression that he had vanquished death, that he could go on to claim that he had died and risen and could send them into all the world and promise to be with them until the end of time if he had just swooned. Some say, well, it was a hallucination. All the sightings of Jesus were false. People didn't want to believe that Jesus had died, and this led to hallucinations. Both the Luke and John Gospels emphasize the disciples' own disbelief at the solidity of what they were seeing. The Luke, for example, the author Luke, he wonderly reported, they offered him a piece of fish, and which he took and he ate it before their eyes. That's some hallucination. The... Uh, the author John noted the disciples Thomas, disciple Thomas' insistence that he was not prepared to believe unless he was able to put his fingers into the wound in Jesus' side and recorded that Jesus was specifically allowed to do this. He says, look at my hands and my feet to Thomas. Touch me. Explain the resurrection as a hallucination is not plausible. Besides, once the way got carried away, the authorities would simply have produced a body to expose the false teaching. Some would say, well, the body was stolen by the Roman or Jewish authorities. Others would say it was stolen by the disciples. But the most plausible explanation for the empty tomb was that Jesus rose again. But let's finalize this and we'll be done. Jesus' disciples' lives changed and the world changed after Jesus' life. People don't die for a lie when they know it's a lie. And yet that's what we see. The world was turned upside down. And the apostles gave their lives as martyrs for a living Savior. The church grew immeasurably. We see it's growing. Other historical changes took place. The Sabbath day, the original day of worship for the Jews, was, became Sunday, the day of worship. We celebrate communion or the Lord's table. These are just doctrinal things that we do because of a risen Savior. But there's some practical things. The calendar changed. And it was now, instead of before Christ, in the year of our Lord now. Anno Domini. But finally, Jesus has changed lives throughout history, and he is still changing them. If you want to doubt the resurrection and the miracle of the resurrection, and sometimes I think we forget the power of the resurrection, don't forget that God still changes lives, that there is still power. So, why do we believe a dead man walked out of a tomb? 
Because Jesus is a big deal. Jesus was a historical person. Jesus is the point of the history of Israel. Jesus is spoken about by the prophets of Israel. Jesus claims to be divine or corroborated by his life, teaching, and miracles. Jesus' death and resurrection cannot be explained away. Jesus' disciples' lives in the world dramatically changed after his life. And Jesus has changed lives throughout history, and he's still changing them. So where have we been over the last 10 10, uh, weeks? We looked at the purpose and process of apologetics. We went from there to see the existence of God, which brought us to the problem of evil, and we wrestled with that. But we found that the scriptures are reliable, and we finish it here with the resurrection, upon which we build our entire faith and practice. For without it, we would be miserable. And so I trust that if you don't get anything else out of these ten weeks... Just get this. Just have a desire to know Him and the power of His resurrection. Because it is that resurrection. It is because we serve a living Savior that we have a reason to live. And it's that risen Savior that we can tell. We could try to convince people that our world is is, is going down the tubes. It's probably not hard. We could try to convince them that we're in a secular world and we're just not thinking right. We could try to convince them that God exists. We can rev- convince them that, hey, there is a problem of evil, but God is working in our lives. We can tell them about how good the, the Bible is and how reliable it is, but at the end of the day, the only way to heaven is the Holy Spirit needs to draw them to the Son. It is the way the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. So when you share the gospel, when you defend the faith, it ultimately has to go back to, do they believe? And no amount of logical arguments is going to convince them they've just got to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to be strong in our faith, Lord, I pray that we would not get to this point where it is all academic. Father, I think sometimes we have downplayed the emotional aspects of our faith. And we've suppressed that. But Father, as our soul is moved, as our spirit is quickened, at times bring us to tears. It should, at times, cause us to laugh and smile and rejoice. And it should, at times, cause us to raise holy hands in worship to you. Father, I pray that we would not be so academic that we forget or we lose sight of how real you are. That you cannot be contained by a textbook or you cannot be contained by notes, but we serve a living Savior and we have the Holy Spirit. And Father, we have a world that is lost and dying and they need you. And so I pray, Father, we would be faithful to share the gospel not to get in arguments, not to fight, but to share the gospel so that others might glorify you with us, to bring glory to you. Help us to do better at it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and have a good evening.